What if Bo-Katan defeated Maul for the Darksaber? In the primary timeline, Bo-Katan leaves the throne room after Maul defeats Pre Vizsla for possession of the Darksaber, thus earning the title of ruler. However, on one of our old videos, Josiah Perky asked what if instead Bo-Katan had stayed and defeated Maul. That's the scenario we're exploring in this video today. So without any more delay, let's get right into it. Our story takes place in the backdrop of the latter half of the Clone Wars. The Empire is being built and battles still rage across space. However, for the purposes of this video, we're only really going to dive deeply into how Maul's defeat impacts Mandalore and the Shadow Collective. Our story starts in Sindari's throne room after Maul decapitates Pre Vizsla and wins control of the Darksaber. Maul gloats, championing that he is one, and he demands the allegiance of Death Watch. All of them begin to bow. However, just like in Clone Wars, Bo-Katan refuses to follow him. In this story, she doesn't back down and run away like she did in the Clone Wars. Instead, she challenges Maul to a second duel, saying that she believes that an outsider like him could never rule Mandalore. While it is implausible that Bo-Katan could have won an initial fight, Maul is fatigued from the battle with Pre Vizsla. In his arrogance, he still believes that he can beat the young Mandalorian, especially given the mastery that he has over the Force, along with his new possession of both the Darksaber and his Red Blade. Maul jumps in with ferocity, battering Bo with blow after blow. Bo's Mandalorian training kicks in, and she's able to fend off each of these attacks. Bo is also in a much more sound state of mind than Maul. While he had been mostly fixed by Mother Talzin, he still has his bouts of insanity that creep into his psyche. As he fights Bo, his desire for power and revenge begins to overtake him, and he turns into a ferocious animal, charging at Bo. She rolls out of the way and uses a vibroblade that she had in her possession to stab Maul in the back as he rampaged, taking the Darksaber from the corpse's hand and raising it towards the sky, letting out a guttural battle cry. Maul's arrogance had finally gotten the best of him. Now, Bo would lead her world, just as she had always wanted to. Following the death of his brother, Savage quickly flees the scene. Almec, who had walked in with a pair of dark side force wielders, now stands frozen with fear, his eyes wide. Savage is pursued for a long time, but his athletic ability and mastery of the Force allow him to escape. Almec is thrown in prison again. How does this impact the rest of our story? Well, let's keep going and find out. The first action that Bo-Katan takes as ruler of Mandalore is to truly attempt to reclaim the honor of her people, returning them to their old ways. Maul's despotic criminal empire had made Mandalore look weak, and Bo hated that she had been forced to work with them in order to gain power. Still being young and eager to further her influence, as soon as Bo-Katan kills Maul, she turns her fury to the galaxy's underworld. All of the prisoners that Death Watch had captured in their vigilante reclamation of Sindari were immediately ordered to be put to death, which was to the immense delight of the people. Bo also decides that the treacherous prime minister from her sister's reign, Almec, is far too much of a snake to be kept alive. While he attempts to reason with Bo, she hears none of it, calling him traitorous for dealing with the same criminals that had just humiliated the Mandalorian pacifist government in front of the entire galaxy. Bo, being the traditional Mandalorian that she is, gives him the option of either dying simply by public execution or by having a warrior's death in one-on-one -on -one combat with her, just like the good old days. She even gives him the opportunity to wear his gold-adorned armor that we see him wearing in the final arc of Star Wars The Clone Wars. Naturally, seeing a chance to possibly beat Bo and reclaim his former position of power within the government, Almec accepts. During this visit, Bo also sees Satine, who had been locked up by Maul in order to seduce Kenobi. Satine begs Bo not to take this course of action, as it would only lead to the destruction of the Mandalorian people, just like it had in the past. Bo, though, isn't hearing any of it. She tells Satine that the only reason she isn't dead is because they're sisters, and she hopes that Satine has time to think about how she made Mandalore weak while she rots in this prison cell. Then, Bo departs the jail. Bo's match with Almec is held within the next week, and Bo absolutely mops the floor with the former Prime Minister, who underestimated her skill for someone of her age. Bo's confidence had grown significantly since her defeat of Maul, and she has the popular support of her people. Duel is held in the public square, and many residents of Sundari watch in awe. If O hadn't had the loyalty of her people before, in the moment that the Darksaber came down to decapitate the sleazy, publicly hated Almec, she solidified her popularity. They would do whatever she said. In the coming days, the Mandalorians begin to reclaim their old traditions and heritage. 
Bo reaches out to the various clan leaders from across the Mandalore system, showing them that she had won the Darksaber in battle, and that she planned to lead their people back to the forefront of galactic affairs. Under the rule of Bo-Katan, no longer would Mandalore be the laughing stock of the galaxy. Leaders like Gar Saxon and Hersa Wren, who were eager to gain influence for their houses within the new Mandalorian hierarchy, are quick to agree with Bo, and Mandalore unites further under her leadership. Seeking revenge on the Shadow Collective for their crimes against her people, and wanting to finally rid her world of black market officials once and for all, Bo-Katan launches a war on the crime lords the likes of which Mandalore has never seen before. She uses the Night Owls, along with other loyal Mandalorians, to comb the streets of Sindari for any organized criminal activity. If anyone associated with any of the criminal gangs is caught, they're killed on sight. Most Mandalorians who are reclaiming their sense of nationalistic civil pride are quite pleased with Bo's crackdown on these people who had injected themselves into Mandalorian society and were trying to prosper on sowing further seeds of division on Mandalore. The other houses follow suit in their own territory, although they don't have as much organized crime to deal with in their spheres of influence. Most of the gang activity is on Sundari. For a long time, the gangs of the Shadow Collective ignore the Mandalorians. They have greater concerns, especially since there is a significant amount of infighting to determine Maul's successor. Eventually, after a large amount of bloodshed, Crimson Dawn begins to emerge as one of the dominant factions within the Shadow Collective especially since Dryden Voss wins over the support of the Hunts by promising them more control over areas of the Shadow Collective influence and increased profits for their criminal enterprises. Dryden ends up becoming the head of the Shadow Collective, forcing the other criminal enterprises into submission with Hut Muscle and Bounty Hunters. While still a relatively new figure in the established criminal underworld, Voss was proving resourceful and he's able to consolidate power over the arrogant, complacent leaders of gangs like the Black Sun and the Pikes. Those who don't agree with his policies are bribed onto his side, or they're killed. As Voss is doing this, Mandalore continues to hunt down and kill prominent figures within the criminal empire in their system. They've expanded beyond the planet of Mandalore now, actively seeking the leaders with whom Bo had once conspired and who had helped bring her to power. Dryden sees this as a threat to his influence, and honestly a mockery of what the Shadow Collective had worked to achieve, and he decides that enough is enough. He would crush these insolent Mandalorians and bring them under his control. One thing that Bo-Katan has in the back of her mind ever since taking over Mandalore is the fact that Savage Opress is still out there. He had escaped her clutches once and she had seen how the treacherous Darksiders could act firsthand. While Savage wasn't her first priority, she knew that he would eventually show up again, seeking revenge for the death of his brother, if he wasn't dead. Bo keeps her ears open and she believes that Savage is dead but she still wants to listen for news of the resurfacing of her old adversary. Eventually, Savage does return to the scene, and Bo doesn't hear about it. For months, he's been wandering the galaxy in a gauntless class fighter that he had stolen from Mandalore in his escape, looking to work odd jobs and the like. He takes on a journey similar to that of Ventress in the Clone Wars, looking for purpose in the galaxy after seeing his entire life shattered before his eyes. Eventually, he takes up a job for Crimson Dawn. When he reports into the crime boss that he's working for, the boss immediately recognizes Savage, and he's shocked. The boss calls Dryden, telling him that the yellow-skinned Dathomirian that they had once believed dead was still among the living, wandering the galaxy. Dryden, realizing the potential that Savage could hold for the Shadow Collective, and for bringing them more power, tells the boss to bring Savage to his personal pleasure yacht, First Light. The boss obliges, and Savage is brought to Dryden. Upon his arrival, Savage is treated to the option of having an extremely luxurious stay, which he refuses. He doesn't need these worldly pleasures. All that Savage wants is to further his power and to gain revenge for the death of his brother. He tells Dryden this much, and the leader of Crimson Dawn tells him that he could have all that he desired if he just helped Dryden in developing this war with Mandalore. Savage could be one of Crimson Dawn's top lieutenants, and he could consolidate all of the power that he desired within the Shadow Collective while simultaneously getting revenge on the Mandalorian that had killed Maul. Savage likes this proposition, and he pledges allegiance to this new master, Dryden Voss. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this story, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications as we update this channel weekly with new What If content. Now, back to the story. After Savage joins Crimson Dawn, 
The Shadow Collective begins to increase the frequency of brutal counterattacks on territory that the Mandalorians have taken from these criminal enterprises. Savage acts as Dryden's enforcer, mowing down Mandalorians without mercy. He's fueled by the promise of exacting revenge on Bo, and he won't stop until he gets what he wants. Dryden consolidates further control over the Shadow Collective by promising to send Savage after anyone who didn't obey his commands, prompting many who were considering going against Dryden to remain in line. Bo hears of Savage's return, and she doubles down on her commitment to forcing these sleazy galactic criminals into submission. Sadly, though, the territory that Bo had gained begins to falter. Despite uniting all of the Mandalorian houses under one banner, her forces were spread too thin across the nearby systems to adequately counter many of the organized, galaxy-spanning efforts of the Shadow Collective. Eventually, she's forced to recall her main forces back to Mandalore, abandoning her hopes of defeating the criminals who had taken her world by storm. However, the Mandalorians who were battling these criminals had fought valiantly, and they were adorned with much praise from leadership and the civilians when they returned to Sundari. Dryden Voss is not satisfied with Mandalore's retreat from the systems under Shadow Collective influence. Neither is Savage. Both of them are eager for a fight, and Savage is ready to kill the woman who had murdered Maul. Voss believes that if they don't launch a direct assault on Mandalore, and if you don't end up removing Bo from power, then the Mandalorians will inevitably regroup and try to destroy the Shadow Collective again, damaging valuable equipment and resources for their cause. Beyond that, Voss believes that if Bo-Katan is left in charge, he very well may break the neutrality of her planet and ask for aid from the Republic to deal with these criminals. Voss doesn't want any of the galactic governments to become involved with his consolidation of power. So, Dryden, Savage, and the heads of the other crime families within the Shadow Collective decide that earning complete submission of Mandalore would be prudent in the grand scheme of things. So, they build up their forces in the shadows, as their name suggests, amassing them at a discreet location selected by First Light. After a few weeks of preparations, the leaders of the Shadow Collective were ready to attack Mandalore. Some of the crime bosses, notably of the Pikes and the Black Sun, are skeptical about using a significant portion of their organization's resources for what was essentially a personal crusade by Dryden and Savage. In the grand scheme of things, the criminals had larger issues to deal with than one system that had stopped attacking their supply lines. They try to get the Huts on board with this, but the Huts are still firmly in the pockets of Dryden. Not wanting to risk the rage of Savage, these crime syndicates go along with the plan, especially with the promise of Beskar profits. Soon, Mandalore would see one of the toughest days that it had faced in many years. Bo-Katan is not prepared for the criminal attack on her Mandalorian kingdom. When the Shadow Collective's fleet appears in the sky above Mandalore, she's taken aback. However, she is also quick to respond. Mandalorians never surrender, and her people are eager to follow her into battle against these aggressors. Soon, a massive battle ensues, one that is on par with the Siege of Mandalore that we see in the Clone Wars. Brutal enforcers from Crimson Dawn, the Pikes, the Huts, and the Black Sun pour down on Sundari, their ships quickly descending into the atmosphere. Immediately after seeing the Unholy Criminal Alliance pop up on her radar screens, Bo orders the Gauntlet Starfighters deploy to counter them, along with Death Watch and Night Owl troopers stationed in Sundari. After an incredibly brief holo call with all of the other leaders of Mandalorian houses, she's also commanding that they immediately deploy their defenses with the goal of protecting the homeworld, Mandalore, along with everything that their unified culture was beginning to build. Mandalorians from Cronest, Concord Dawn, and Mandalore itself all come together to fight the attacking criminals, both in the space above Mandalore and on the ground. Savage, alongside Zitan Maj and Long Pike, lead their forces into battle on the ground. The Hut Cartel had sent their finest commanders from the Syndicate to command the battle in the sky, and the Hut Council monitors the battle via hologram on the capital ship of their flotilla. Dryden monitors the battle in first light, smiling at how he had taken the Mandalorians off guard. The criminals have a difficult time taking the city, especially because of the new tenacity of the Mandalorians. Over the past few months, they'd reclaimed much of their old warrior culture, and although many of them were not as experienced in conflict as their leader, they were ready to follow her to the ends of the universe. The Mandalorians came into battle with superior equipment and spirit, and they end up taking on the criminal forces with more ferocity than expected. However, gradually, with Savage's force aptitude and the sheer number of troops on the ground from the criminals, the Mandalorian forces are pushed back to Bo-Katan's palace. The battle in the sky rages on, with many Mandalorian pilots weaving their gauntlets through the Shadow Collective fleet. 
but they are severely outnumbered. While reinforcements continue to pour in from Concord Dawn and Cronus, they are still severely outnumbered by the criminals. After seeing the damage that the Mandalorians do to their equipment, however, the Huts begin to question their support of Dryden, yet they agree to continue to support him. After all, when the Shadow Collective controlled Mandalore, there would be a significant profit that would trickle to their cartel from the Beskar lines. This is part of the reason that the Pikes and the Black Sun also continue to support Dryden's leadership. Finally, on the ground, Savage manages to break through the wall of Mandalorians protecting Bo's palace on Sundari. For the entire battle, she had been attempting to organize and coordinate her troops from the throne room, giving commands to many different groups alongside her most trusted officials. When Savage bursts into the throne room alongside Zitan Maj and Lom Pike, he interrupts Bo just as she's commanding a force of Mandalorians that are attempting to keep the palace safe. Savage screams at her, raising his double-sided saber in her direction. Bo freezes, recognizing his distinct growl. Savage challenges Bo to a duel, just as Maul had done with Pre Vizsla a few months before. Bo's heart is pounding, but she knows that if she refuses, she will lose all of the respect that she had gained from her subordinates, and her dream of a united Mandalore would collapse. She gives her brothers and sisters in arms an intense look, nodding to them, before pulling out the Darksaber, putting on her helmet, and accepting the challenge. The duel between Savage and Bo is vicious. Savage's mastery of the Force, along with his brute strength, often take Bo off guard. However, she is still more nimble than the Sith and she has a jetpack at her disposal. There are times when she flies in the air and uses her pistol in favor of the Darksaber, firing at the brutish son of Dathomir. However, he deflects all of these bolts back towards her, once again forcing Bo to the ground to try and defeat him one-on-one. -on -one. Eventually, Savage knocks the Darksaber from her hands, but Bo remains resilient. She uses her blue wrist shields to counter Savage's lightsaber attacks, even beginning to push him backwards by using his movement against him. With this space, Bo picks up the Darksaber and swings it at Savage, which the Sith Acolyte blocks. However, Bo presses on, swinging ferociously. Eventually, the pair end up with their blades locked, staring into each other's eyes. In this moment, Bo has an idea. She allows Savage to push her backwards, getting close enough for her to feel his breath on her face. In this moment, Savage snarls at Bo, to which she responds with a quick smirk. Bo activates one of her wrist daggers, which cuts into Savage's arm. He cries out in pain, and in this moment of weakness, Bo overwhelms him, stabbing him through the chest. Bo raises the Darksaber to the sky and cries out with ecstasy, victorious once again. However, upon seeing this, Zitan and Maj leer, stating that they don't follow the same values as the rest of her pathetic Mandalorian nation. They open fire upon Bo, whose Beskar armor absorbs the blunt of the first few shots. Bo fires back and so do her troops. However, they soon realize that they're outgunned. Bo, who in this timeline doesn't believe in running, stands her ground. Eventually, after a hard-fought battle, she's gunned down by the sheer number of criminals that had broken through her defenses of the palace. A couple of her most trusted officials managed to barely escape, using their jetpacks to get away after Bo's death, but most of the people who had been in the room with her end up also being slain. Bo's sacrifice and valiance would be remembered in the songs of Mandalore for years to come, and the way that she had been betrayed by a dishonorable foe would be not lost on her people. With Bo's death, the unified Mandalorian defense effort fractured. Clan Saxon, Clan Wren, and the Mandalorian Protectors all withdraw from Mandalore and go back to their own worlds. Some of the Death Watch and Night Owls in Sindari fight on to their deaths, whereas others are captured and tortured for their insolence against the Shadow Collective. Some of the captured Mandalorians end up joining the Shadow Collective, wanting to continue to satisfy their bloodthirst and gain some petty cash while they're at it. After all, not all of the Mandalorian people were in this for honor and glory. Some just wanted to pick a good fight, and they didn't care who they worked for to get that. The general population of Mandalore now lives in fear, watching every step, worried that the criminals would take their life in an instant for any minor inconvenience. When Dryden Voss visits his newly claimed planet, he finds two things. Firstly, he is gifted the Darksaber by Zitan and Lom, who don't care about its significance, but know that Dryden has a large collection of cultural objects in his office. Dryden is instantly in love, and he slides it onto his belt with glee. Second, Dryden finds the former Duchess Satine of Mandalore in prison. He offers the old position of Duchess back to her, telling Satine that she needs to be a puppet leader so that he could cover up this entire operation to the Republic, 
and hide the Shadow Collective's true scope of influence. He tempts her by telling her that these were the people who had turned against her for their own personal gain, so that she should want to exact revenge on them. Satine refuses, saying that she would never abandon her principles in order to obtain more power. So, Dryden kills her immediately, running her through with the Darksaber. He finds someone else that takes him up on the offer, Gar Saxon. Just like in Rebels, he's eager to profit off of the fall of Mandalore, even though he had a part in its defense. Many loyal followers in his house follow suit, but some do not. Those Mandalorians are killed by Saxon, and he returns to Mandalore to act as Dryden's puppet leader. At the death of Satine, Obi-Wan can feel something deep in his core. The Force calls out to him, and grief strikes him. Although he isn't physically present for her execution, he can still sense her demise. It impacts him just the same. In the end, Maul did end up getting his revenge on the Jedi that had tormented his soul for years. How do these events impact the final chapter of our story? Let's continue and find out. As the events of Order 66 play out across the galaxy, Mandalore remains under the firm control of the Shadow Collective. Gar Saxon welcomes the presence of the Empire, unlike in Rebels where the Mandalorians resist Imperial occupation. Dryden keeps the Darksaber as the prized item in his collection, and as a trophy of how he had defeated the mighty Mandalore. While the Imperials seize a sizable portion of the Beskar production, a deal is struck with Saxon, and thus the Shadow Collective, where if he remains loyal to the Empire and continues to keep the Mandalorians in line, he can maintain a chunk of the mines for his own house. While the Shadow Collective grumbles about this, they decide that it is a worthwhile trade-off to avoid outright war with the Empire. As their name implies, they operate in the shadows, for the most part. Despite this bleak look for the Mandalorian people, there is still hope. House Ren and the Mandalorian protectors are not pleased with these developments. While they comply, they lament behind closed doors. Sabine is still raised as she was before, and she still becomes radicalized to the rebel cause. The old servants of Bo-Katan sing her songs and praises as refugees on these offshoot worlds, hoping that one day they can rebuild Death Watch and the Night Owls to once again solidify Mandalore under one banner. All of these tensions continue to build and distaste for both the Shadow Collective and the Empire link. However, one thing that the Mandalorians lack is central leadership. One day, a new champion would rise to unite the remaining honorable Mandalorians under one creed and challenge the cruel hand of Dryden Voss. One day, Mandalore would rise again. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this what if scenario. If you did, consider checking out this other what if video, what if Vader stopped Alderaan's destruction. Have a great day everyone, and as always, I hope that you've had your daily dose of Bantha Stew.